Hello, everyone. I'm Ambrose Bonner Sargent, and today, and uh, welcome to, uh, to my talk, and this is Type Closure in Practice. So for the first few minutes, I'm going to have to ask you to keep your brain switched on, and I'm going to be quizzing you throughout the, this introduction. So when we see this uh, Closure logo, I, I hope you can see it's kind of shadowed in the background. Maybe you can't. Uh, but I'll tell you when it's cl closure and untyped closure, uh, type closure and, and untyped closure. So this is just a simple function that has, it, it has two arities, and basically what it does, it takes either nil or a non-empty collection and then returns an integer that, uh, that summarizes that collection. So it's basically a hashing function. So it has an, an interesting loop invariant, which is that uh, the end seek, this first argument, has to always be nil or a non-empty vector non empty collection, rather. So let's run this code. OK. Uh, sorry. <laughs> That's uh, summarizing nil, and we get back 42. So what happens if we try and summarize a vector? So what's the worst thing that can happen in Java? Give me one thing. What's even worse than that? Oh my god. Well done. So this is what we actually get if we run this code. And instead of using closure to debug this, let's convert this to type closure and find the bug. So the first thing to do when converting closure to type closure is to add a namespace dependency to our closure code. And yeah, you can't see the type closure logo. So this is now typed code. So we run the type checker, and we get back some errors. So the first time we run, a type, run the type checker over some code, the, we're very likely to get this error, which is an unannotated var. And this tells us that type closure uses local type inference, which means that we have to provide annotations for our top-level definitions. So let's do that for summarize. So we annotate summarize. The first arity takes nil or a non-empty collection of ints and returns an int. And the second arity is the same, but it has an extra accumulator int. But you know, there's some parentheses overload, so let's convert the, uh, the, this common type into a, an alias. And we'll call it nints or nillable ints. And if you can't uh, read the, uh, the, the type annotation, uh, you can also add, add a doc string to def alias. So uh, you can read it in, in English and then convert it to, uh, to type closure types. So nints is nil or a persistent non-empty collection of ints. So let's type check this code. So we get a, a, a little more productive error than uh, cannot find the type of summarize. This time it's complaining about a particular invocation of summarize. This is a function application error. This means that a particular application of a function uh, is being passed bad arguments. First thing you do when you see this, uh, this error is compare the domains, which are the expected types for the function, to the arguments, which are the actual types being, uh, being passed here. And the, the uh, Invocation in question here is the one underlined. So what we do, we compare n ints to a seek of int, and there's our problem. We try to give a possibly empty seek to something that expects a nillable or non-empty seek of integers. So we're actually using the wrong function uh, in our uh, recursive call. There's a very subtle difference between two functions that I'm about to explain to you. Uh, so there's this rest function. It's a sequence function. It takes any seekable or nil, as you can see from the, the red um, type annotation up the top. So for all x, takes a nil or a seekable of x and returns a seek of x. And you can see the actual behavior in these examples. So this is always going to be a true value. So that's where our stack overflow kept going, because our loop invariant assumed that um, the collection was going to be nil or a false value, uh, and then the uh, recursion would stop. So actually, there's a different uh, function called next, which is the one that we want. So let's read the type for next. For all types x, takes nil or a seekable of x and returns nil or a non-empty seek of x. So this is actually much closer to what we want. So let's check the example to see if it actually is. So if we have the next of an empty vector and the next of nil, we get, uh, we get nil, which is a false value. And this will terminate our, um, our recursion. So let's add this and type check. Great, it worked. So back to our untyped closure buffer. Uh, 
So the, the top line says summarize the th a three uh, element vector and we get back this number. Great, okay, this is looking a bit more like a hashing algorithm now. We can summarize nil, uh, great, we get 42. You know, but it would be nice to be able to summarize empty vectors. So who, who wants to guess what happens now? We've had, we've had Stack Overflow. What's the second worst thing? <laughs> Null pointer. Bang. Again, let's fix this with type closure. So here's our invocation up the top, summarize the empty vector. And type closure tells us we've actually passed an empty vector where we're expecting a nillable ints. So you can, just to remind you, there's the definition of, of nillable ints. It's a union of nil or a non-empty collection of ints. And of course, the empty vector is none of those things. So what's the first thing we want to do to, uh, to support this code, to support this uh, empty vector? So why don't we just erase any instances of, of non-empty in this slide? And then type check it. OK, so type closure is telling us that our code is not sufficient to avoid uh, an error. And we knew that because there was a null pointer exception. But uh, we get a new uh, invocation error that tells us that the second argument to multiply uh, is being passed a union of nil and int. And we're actually expecting a number. So that's, that sounds uh, pretty fishy. This is probably where the null pointer exception came from. And if we want to convince ourselves that this is actually possible, let's simulate the, the program. Let's uh, replace our, our sequence parameter with the empty vector. So if we follow through, we check if uh, the empty vector is, uh, is a true value. It is. We go down the then branch. Bam, we get first of the empty vector, which enclosure is null. And that's where our null pointer came from. So this tells us that our, um, our conditional is insufficient to, uh, to distinguish between uh, our empty check is not strong enough. So any closure programmer will tell you that you need to use this function called seek. And let's have a look at the type. So it's, it's very much like, uh, like next. It takes a union of nil and a collection of x and returns nil or a non-empty seek of x. And we can see the subtle differences in the example. If we pass it a non-empty sequence, it returns a true value. If we pass it a, an empty sequence or nil, it returns a false value. So OK, let's, let's update this. Huh. It just kind of worked. So we updated the conditional, and type closure tells us that this code is not going to throw a null pointer exception. So we'll get back to this point later on. But uh, notice that we, we, only, we didn't need to add any extra uh, annotations here. So just to convince us all, this is untyped closure, and it works for all three use cases. So type closure is an optional type system that catches type errors in real closure code. And the rest of this talk will be detailing exactly that claim. So I jumped right in with an example. Let's just step back for a minute and look at the history of type closure. Where have we come from? It all kind of started ClojureCon 2011. I was giving a talk on core logic and logic programming. And somehow, Will Bird and Dan Friedman made their way into the audience, which is honestly the coolest and most petrifying thing to, to, to have happened uh, if you're talking in front of 300 people and it's your first conference. And you know, you're know you lecturing Will Bird and Dan Friedman about their research. So if they're in the audience right now, it's my research now. So thank god. <laughs> But if I wasn't worrying about Will Bird and Dan Friedman judging me, which of course they, they wouldn't, they're very nice people, but if I wasn't doing that, I was collecting ideas for my honours dissertation. Uh, so here's a, a bunch of closurers uh, at, uh, at ClojureConch, and I was basically asking these, uh, these closure programmers what, is the, what are the problems that they're having with, with closure and what, what are the, the kinds of tools that they want to see, and this idea of static typing kept coming up. So I had my direction. So back I fly to Perth, exactly the other side of the world, and uh, to my uh, undergraduate uh, university, the University of Western Australia. And this is the, the campus at about uh, sunset. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the Swan River, beautiful Swan River on the, the top right. When I wasn't observing the, the lovely views, however, I was writing type closure with Rowan Davies. 
And my thesis was that type closure is both practical and useful. So that was in 2012. And the, the main product of that work was the implementation of type closure, which is called core type. So core type is the actual implementation of type closure. And I use type closure as kind of an um, umbrella term for the tooling and the, the theory and the, uh, the checker. So I might accidentally interchange them, but don't be too confused, hopefully. So um, something cool happened. I got invited back to ClojureCon the next year to present this. So it kind of came full circle, uh, which was pretty awesome. But last year, this probably will interest the most people in this room. If you want to fund uh, your programming language, feel free to come talk to me because uh, I've successfully ran a, a, a crowdfunding campaign to fund about a year of development on type closure. And I had 545 uh, funders who raised $35,000. And I'm sure some of you in the audience right now, thank you very much. I had uh, a brilliant year. and. You know, I've, I've, it, it's brought me to, to America, basically, to start grad school. But here are some of the, the companies that, that have uh, donated, uh, well, who funded my, uh, my year. And you might recognize some of them as uh, some closure companies. One in particular, we're going to have a look at their large type closure code base later on and some, um, some statistics and some analysis. So where I'm based now is Bloomington, Indiana, which is what that text box says up there. And I've started my grad school there. And here's the, the Sample Gates, which is the most photogenic place in, uh, in Indiana University. But uh, cooler than that is I get to work with Sam Tobin Hodgstadt. So in 2012, I, I, I had this problem. I got closure. I want types. But there's also this cool tool called Type Racket, which had this problem, we've got Racket, we want types. So I basically took most of this, uh, th this amazing research and, uh, and theory and applied it to, to Clojure. And you know, two, two, three years later, I'm, I'm working for him. So uh, the, the future is bright. So we're at the present day. Where are we now? Something exciting that's happening in the Clojure world is this IDE called Cursive Clojure. If you haven't used it, or if you're new to, new to Clojure, I highly recommend trying it out. I know people who have dropped Emacs and Vim for it, and you know I'm kind of on the fence. It's, it's pretty cool. And this guy, Colin Fleming, he's presenting it at ClojureCon this year, so look out for that talk. But uh, why I'm mentioning it now is that he's, add, he's, he's added uh, support for type closure in the IDE. So uh, here's one example of a, the function application error style of error that we saw before. Uh, we've moused over the, the red squiggly lines, so hey, we're in a statically typed language now. This is great. We're, the, uh, the tooling can actually make use of this. And this is something that's come out of left field recently. If you go to this URL down the bottom, crossclj.info, uh, you'll find this re really cool um, tool that has harvested all these uh, GitHub projects written in Clojure and uh, and link them together on the level of functions and namespaces and, and uh, projects. So we have dependencies uh, across different projects of what functions get called. So one co cool thing that Francesco Bellomi has added is he's harvested the type closure annotations and added them to the closure core documentation. So you can see we've got the documentation for Matt V, we've got some arities, um, and then we've got the, the red uh, type annotation, and then some documentation. So I, I can't not mention my, my very own Vim plugin. If you like Vim, check this out. Um, there is one justification, though. Uh, this Vim plugin does something that no, no Clojure tool has ever done, which is if you mouse over a particular expression, it'll tell you the type of the expression. And th this isn't implemented in the cursive, uh, cursive one yet, but hopefully it will be soon. So this is, this is a, a taste of the kinds of things you can, uh, you can get from having a statically typed language, which uh, we probably all know. But it's, it's pretty cool being able to do it in, in Clojure. So this year, we've had two Google Summer of Code students, one Minori Yamashita from, uh, from Japan. He has worked on bringing typed Clojure to Clojure script, and thus the JavaScript. And Di Zhu from China has been adding, uh, has been improving the type inference in some of the more interesting cases that we come across in Clojure. So let's look. Let's look at some of the details 
of type closure. We have this idea of occurrence typing. So in closure, when we, when we write closure code, different occurrences of the same name aren't necessarily the same type, right? So if we look at this, this simple little function that, I'm, uh, that I have on this slide, this genvec function either takes a number or a vector. And it tests if it's a number. If it is, we go down the then branch. If it's not, then we go down the else branch. But the reason this inference technique is called occurrence typing is because different occurrences of the same variable down different branches have different types. So this is kind of a flow typing idea. So let's just simulate what this program does. If we pass it five, then we go down the then branch, and then we, um, then we end up with this uh, generated vector. If we pass it a vector, then we go down the else branch. But notice the then branch is, is not well typed, so we need to understand that uh, it's not possible to go down this, uh, this first branch. And the secret here is that um, we can add extra annotations to our functions to communicate to type closure exactly what our functions will do. So for example, you can see here, we've got this number question mark that uh, is a, a predicate of num. And this predicate of num tells type closure if this, if this invocation is in the test position of a conditional, when we're down the then branch, you, you should assume that the first argument is a number, otherwise it's not a number. And if you think back to my example with seek before, you could, you could, you could imagine what the, uh, the different things that type closure learns down those two branches. So if we have a conditional on the seek of a binding, if we're down the then branch, that means that the, the binding is, is non-empty, if we're down the else branch, it means that it's either empty or nil. And that's basically, uh, there is literally a type annotation in type closure that says that. And you can just plug into this system uh, as you'd like uh, in the same way here. So here's one of my favorite uh, topics in type closure. Um, it's uh, this idea of a keyword map. If you've ever used closure, you'd, you'd be uh, familiar with, with a keyword map. So in type closure, we've modeled this with a type called a HMAP. Uh, so it's basically a, a map with keyword keys mapped to known uh, values. And then we can, we can type check these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of invocations. So if we follow the associ, uh, the, the associ call at the top, the way to read this is associ onto the empty map, uh, key A to value B, uh, to, to value one, key B to foo, and C to baz. So this uh, type closure uh, infers that this is of type uh, a HMAP with man three mandatory entries, A, B, and, and C, which have uh, a num, stir, and a, and a sim uh, uh, values. So this, uh, we'll see in this next slide, this is the same way to write uh, these, two, these two types. So there's a, 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 if there's a quoted, uh, quoted map, then that's the same as just specifying mandatory entries. So let's combine HMAPs with multi-methods. So multi-methods are a cool feature in Clojure. Uh, it allows you to do dispatch uh, in, a, uh, in an open fashion. So type Clojure can... Um, can type check these, uh, these multi-methods. The first line at the top says def alias expression and then says that uh, expression is a recursive type. And then uh, what, this, what, the, what an expression is, it's basically an abstract syntax tree that has two different, um, two, two different representations. So one, it can be an if node that has an, a test, a then, and an else expression. And Notice we just put these things in a union, so this is a, a, a union type. And we can also have a const op, um, which is, uh, it has a, a const keyword uh, and a, a value that is a number. So this particular, uh, this particular multi-method takes a, an expression, as you can see on the annotation, uh, takes an expression and then takes a function from number to number and then returns another expression. And then it dispatches on the op key, and that's uh, what's happening on the right of the def multi there. 
So the interesting thing is here that uh, we know particular information about the, uh, the type of E in these two methods. So uh, clearly the, the type of, of, of the expression of the first argument is going to be uh, an op with an if. So uh, when we destructure this, type closure should uh, figure out exactly which one of these two union cases it is. And um, on the same with the const. So if we get to the const, we know that the, uh, we have the, the const HMAP uh, union member. So when we get to this point, val is always going to be a number. So we can, um, we can apply f to val, and it's all type checking correctly. So this means we can have code like this that, that, uh, that type closure can tell you is correct. So we, we can say we have a, an if expression with a, a test, then an else, and we want to increment all these, uh, all the, uh, all the leaves. And then, um, yeah, we end up with a test two, three, four uh, for the different nodes. So onto polymorphism. Here's a little snippet that I found on GitHub. Someone was playing around with core async. So core typed and core async work, work fairly well with each other. This is a function that takes a, 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 it takes a function and then returns another function that's lifted to the, uh, to the level of channels. So to understand this, let's look at the, at the type annotation. So for all x, y, for all types x and for all uh, types y, it takes in a function from x to y and returns a channel of x, uh, and returns a function that takes a channel of x and returns a channel of y. And you can see on this bottom line, we're actually using this lift channel to make a channel that, uh, that converts lowercase strings to uppercase strings. And interestingly, we don't need to, uh, to provide which x's and y's uh, in this spot because we, we use local type inference. So it turns out this isn't quite enough to type check most closure idioms. We need to go a, little, a step further. So here's the, the motivating example for this idea of variable arity polymorphism. So if you've ever used schemes map or, um, or rackets map or closures map, you'll know that you can pass uh, an, a surprising number of things to it and, uh, and it just does the right thing. So the rules are if you pass uh, uh, n number of collections, your first argument must have n number of parameters. So uh, the cool thing about variable arity polymorphism is that you can express this type in just one, um, one type annotation that's basically like a template that expands and, and shrinks as needed. So in this particular example, we have three, co three collections. The first one has nums, the second one has stirs, and then the last one has booleans. And uh, you can see that we have three parameters corresponding to those, um, to those arguments there. So we do have to actually annotate this, uh, this function because of the, the rules of local type inference. We can't both look for the, uh, the, uh, the type of map and define the type of this function at the same time. So that's a little restriction that you have to keep in mind when actually using uh, closure and, uh, type closure in practice. So type closure doesn't actually add any runtime uh, mechanisms. So closure does very well with just def types and um, protocols. It does have records as well, but they're basically data types. So um, type closure can, can uh, annotate these definitions so, and then check their, their usages. So we have a protocol, an adder protocol, that has a, uh, an add method. And it takes uh, itself, uh, all protocols have its own, uh, always take itself, always take the, the target this as the first argument. So we don't need, we don't need to annotate that. Uh, but the, 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 first, the second argument, the y, is a number. And then we return another adder. So we can extend this in the uh, def type, and all we need to do is annotate that, uh, that field in the, in the A, that X field. And then we can construct, the, uh, def, we can construct the, the def type and then pass it to the protocol uh, as we like. And this type checks in, uh, in type closure. So uh, finally in this section, we have Java interop. So type closure, type closure like closure uh, works fairly well with Java. So here's, uh, can anyone spot the bug in this code? So we get the parent of a file, and then we get the parent of the parent. 
what are we going to get if we pass a parent, uh, pass a file that doesn't have a grandparent? Null pointer, excellent. So type closure tells us this, and this is the way it tells you. So it, you cannot call an instance method with a nillable type. So it knows that you, you could possibly do this, but it's not convinced that this will avoid null pointer exceptions. And you can see this is different from the way that Java treats uh, uh, reference types. So in, in other words, uh, reference types in type closure are non-nullable and nil and null are exactly the same, but they have, uh, they're completely separated, those two concepts. Then we can get back uh, nullable types by simply uh, shoving them into a union like here. So the way to fix this, we all know how to do it. Just uh, check if, if P1 is, uh, is an instance of a file. And if, it's, if it is, then get the parent. So type closure is convinced that this, this will type check, uh, th that this won't throw a null pointer exception at runtime. So let's move on to our case study. So CircleCI is a, a continuous integration uh, company. And this is their web app. Uh, they, I think recently they've allowed uh, adding open source tooling, uh, open source continuous integration of, for uh, arbitrary GitHub projects. So give it a shot, it's pretty cool. But they were fit, pretty excited with type closure. So if you, if you go and read their, um, their blog post on type closure, uh, you, you can tell that they, they were really waiting for a tool like this. Um, so. Th uh, they, they've been using type closure uh, for over a year now, and here's an example of uh, a developer uh, hailing core types, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but they have about 50,000 lines of closure code, and around about 10,000 lines of it is in type closure. So breaking that down, uh, it's, not, it's actually not that easy to uh, separate closure and type closure code, because they're kind of uh, intermingled. So we have this concept of an, uh, a, an annotation that's not checked. So when we add an annotation to a top level binding, we can tell Clojure to either check the binding, the, check the definition, or not check it. So it turns out 46% of uh, around about 600 annotations are checked. So um, it's probably, probably about 5,000 lines. Well, I think it was six or 7,000 lines of, of type closure code are actually being checked in, in Circle CI. So the, uh, the portion in red there is the, the number of annotations that are not checked. So this means that type closure has idioms that it, it cannot check. And uh, Circle CI is saying, OK, let's just leave this as unchecked and then wait for a future version. And unfortunately, this 22% uh, on the top left is also known as yak shaving because to annotate your project, you have to annotate a third-party library. So let's look at a bit, bit of sample code from CircleCI's code base. So they have this function, encrypt key pair, when they connect to Heroku, for example, they have to deal with, uh, deal with private keys. So they want this, uh, this key pair, this encrypt key pair, to take an unencrypted key pair and return an encrypted key pair. So let's have a look at those, those types. So we just have aliases, as we saw before. So we have a HMAP uh, for the raw key pair, and it has two entries. It has a public key, which is raw, so unencrypted, and then a private key, which is raw. But it also has this extra completeness um, property, which says that this HMAP cannot have any more or any less keys. This is fully specified. So it always, always has length two, always has these keys. So an encrypted key pair is the same as a raw key pair, except we've removed the private key and, excuse me, uh, and we've replaced it with an encrypted private key, which has a, another type. So if you notice on the, the third line of code here, we're associating onto a map after dissociating. So what this does, this dissoci key pair private key uh, returns the key pair without the private key, right? So this is pretty integral to making sure that we don't leak out the raw private key. So what happens if we forget to do that? So type closure tells us that we've, we're expecting an encrypted private key, uh, a, a encrypted key pair, but we actually got a HMAP with three entries, which was we had the encrypted key pair, 
uh, with the encrypted private key, we've got the unencrypted public key, but we've also got the unencrypted pri uh, private key. So something that's interesting uh, that kind of uh, validates using uh, HMAPs to, um, to model how closure code works is this statistic here, that uh, out of 64 type aliases that Circle CI uses, about 60% of them are just using HMAPs. So they have functions everywhere that just take keyword maps, return keyword maps, associate things, dissociate things. So, um, so yeah, uh, I'm, that's, that's a good thing. And um, so let's have a look at the future. So we've, we've, seen, we've seen the cool things that type closure can do. What's next? So one thing I'm sure a lot of people in this room would love to see is a closure script type checker because the, the errors, the runtime errors in closure, closure script are, well, just as bad, worse, you know, it depends who you're talking to as, as closure. So uh, you get all the typical JavaScript errors. And this is a pragmatic decision. It's, it's mostly performance related. So static analysis is a good thing to have here. So uh, as I was saying before, we had our um, Google Summer of Code student, Minori, working on this problem. And he was basically uh, starting off uh, similar to other j statically typed JavaScript uh, languages to uh, harvest TypeScript code. Uh, sorry, TypeScript annotations and use them to, to type check uh, JavaScript, um, JavaScript interop. So this is something that's, that's on the cards and should, uh, should be bearing fruit soon. So when I started off implementing type racket in type closure, I basically picked the easy bit. So this is the hard bit. Let me show you what the hard bit is. So if we have untyped code and it, go, it goes over to type land and something goes wrong, you know, everything spazzes out. This basically means our error messages are completely, go, have gone haywire. What we really want to happen is that when we call our untyped closure code, that we protect it. So when this happens, you know, the world doesn't fall apart, right? And this, this means that we get good error messages, and this is exactly what type racket does. And it turns out going the other way is just as important. So if we want to, to pass our typed code to untyped land, well, you know, the, the world could fall over. <laughs> but, you know, we still get a good error message. So this is a very interesting problem that we're going to be working on in the near future. So here's a call to action. If you own a closure library, annotate, uh, add type annotations to it. So people like uh, CircleCI don't need to do their 20% time of yak shaving just to, uh, to use their library. And if you don't have your own, if you don't have your own library, uh, adopt a library. <laughs> and I'm, find me on IRC, find me you know, on, at this conference, I'll, I will tell you exactly uh, my ideas of the best way to annotate your library. And it's not, it doesn't mean that you have to rewrite your uh, application in type closure. It basically amounts to you have a separate namespace that's you know, my namespace dot typed, right? Um, that a type closure programmer would, would require in their namespace uh, and it would, uh, it would automatically add all the annotations of your library. So in conclusion, type closure works in production. If you want to start using it, you can visit typeclosure.org. And I strongly encourage you to annotate your libraries or adopt a library today. Thank you. Any questions? Yep. Is, is the code generator using any of these annotations? So basically, type closure, it's a thin layer of macros over, over closure. So what that means is we can reuse the compiler, we can reuse all tooling, but unfortunately, there is no way to insert this information back into the compilation process. So uh, 
if you can imagine the compilation process going, you know, reading, analyzing em emission, right? What type closure does is it reuses th those machineries, but it goes read, analyze, and then type check. And then, you know, the, the, the arrow just kind of keeps going and, and it, it can't uh, inform the, uh, so it's a bit of, it's a technical issue. Type Racket actually does really well in, the, in that area and um, it improves the numeric performance quite considerably. Yep, better. When are you going to have dependent types? When am I going to have <laughs> dependent types? Uh, there is someone working on uh, dependent types in Type Racket and I don't understand it yet, so I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, about, uh, yeah, 10% sounds about right. So what is the overhead of, of annotating your code? So it really depends on, uh, on the code. It, it seems to be, uh, you can either annotate it easily or it's impossible. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> or let me refer, you can either annotate it easily or type closure is not good enough yet to annotate it. Let's, let's keep it at that. So yeah, about 10% overhead, and it's mostly annotations in positions that are useful, like function parameters, uh, top-level bindings, these data types, protocols, and the things that people can use, uh, like in this cross-CLJ as documentation. So that we don't often need to have silly annotations just to to uh, to please the type checker, but you know you do have to do that every now and again. So can I describe some of the implementation details around implementing gradual typing for type closure? So it's hard. So <laughs> if you've ever used closure, you know that there is no concept of encapsulation. You know, you, if you use a var from a namespace, you just kind of require it into your, uh, into your namespace. You don't copy the var, you just literally use the same var from over here. So you can do whatever you want, right? So there's a problem, right? If we want to use an uh, a untyped closure var, it would be great if we could, you know, simulate using it. But unfortunately, we're actually using that var. So um, we can't simply, you know, encapsulate it in a bubble because that means every code that, that, that touches that var has to go through that bubble, and that's not what we want. We only want the bubble to encapsulate the, the code if we go across the boundary, right? And def types are final, uh, enough said. How do you proxy a final class? I, I, I would love to know. Uh, so I'm learning some bytecode manipulations to solve that problem. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that'll take me months to, to solve, so there's a, a couple. So uh, generic, uh, are Java generics plan to be supported? No, because it, it turns out that this, this works really well and I was very happy not to have to worry about uh, type variables, existentials, bounded polymorphism, and you know, that, that's enough, I, I'm, I'm done. So it's, it's un, that said, there is an implementation for uh, the, the common language runtime, which uh, I'm told does use generics. So that, I may have to solve that problem. I may be forced to solve it. Uh, but if I can avoid it, then I will. <laughs> yep. So what's your opinion on the libraries that take the max schemas and generate the type? Do you think that's a good way to go, or do you think it's like somewhat limiting? So generate the static types? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, so there's this library called Prismatic Schema, which is kind of like a contracts library. It's a popular library. and particular, there are libraries that bridge the gap between core types and schema because you don't want to, to, uh, to write the same annotation twice. You don't want to write the, the contract and the annotation. So I like to think of, uh, so th there are libraries that, uh, that bridge the gap here by uh, creating a common syntax. And basically you, you write the annotation once, it generates the schema and it generates the, uh, the type annotation. So this, this works. It would be nice, however, if type closure just automatically understood the schema. And it, it's actually close. It's almost there. The problem is that uh, schema's syntax 
is, is actually not uh, amenable to these HMAP concepts because uh, in schema, a, uh, a map contract is a keyword map. So great, uh, you, you say um, I want a, a map contract A to num, uh, B to string, right? But they also have um, a special key that they have for optional values. So unfortunately, type closure doesn't have this concept of anything other than a keyword in the HMAP. Of, uh, so it's, it's that close. So uh, there are ways to improve this, so you, you don't need, it doesn't need to be done. And it's really, you know, type closure is the weak link here. The static analysis, uh, unsurprisingly, needs to improve. So it can be done automatically. Could be done. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear there's this language called Racket. And, and <laughs> why don't I first port the Oh yeah, well unfortunately I don't own Clojure. <laughs> so uh, I don't, one of the goals was to, to, to work with regular, um, the regular Clojure compiler. And I, I don't really want to, uh, I guess, I was gonna say complicate. Uh, but uh, it would definitely be more complicated to, to use rackets. Uh, complected. What? <laughs> complected. Oh, complected, okay, yeah. <laughs> so in practice, th th that's just not gonna happen. So I need, uh, I've been dealt these cards and I need to work with the macro system. But of course, it would be amazing if we had this uh, uh, racket-like ecosystem of creating languages where we could intercept uh, the boundaries between languages uh, very precisely, but it's just not the case. Uh, uh, I think that's it. Cool. Thank you.